Hey, thanks for coming out. I know you're all very busy, and I know that with uh, Easter coming up, people are anxious to get away and spend time with their family. So I do thank you, those of you who have uh, arrived today, um, to spend this next hour with me. We're going to cover up um, the seven critical and growing IT security threats all of you guys are um, up against right now, and that you need to protect yourself. You know, to avoid cyber attacks, data breach, lawsuits, ransomware, bank fraud, negative PR, and compliance penalties. Not right now, but it is coming. I promise you. So. Um, uh, what we're going to cover is um, the uh, the number one cybersecurity threat to your business or organization that uh, there are the technical security protocols uh, that you may have in place already aren't covering you for. Uh, two, the shocking truth that about bank fraud that most businesses uh, are not aware of and literally you can have your bank account wiped out and uh, you know, realistically, the most of the clients that I come across or engage with, their uh, existing security posture is simply not enough. And I'm talking about your kind of your, your standard. I've got, I've got, you know, some kind of antivirus on my PC, and I've got spam filtering. I think that kind of stuff. All right. And uh, finally, how mobile phones and cloud apps are sneaking into your organization and uh, jeopardizing your security posture and, and your uh, the, the confidentiality of your data and the things that you need to do to protect yourself. So the reason behind all of this is because I want to make sure that the people that I'm looking after or the people who are engaging with us are not sitting ducks, you know, for the cyber criminals, right? Uh, and, it's, and it's literally, um, you know, one out of five businesses get smacked uh, every year, and um, the average kind of um, cost to that business of having uh, suffered a malware infection or some kind of uh, uh, exposure of, of data onto the to the web is is like nineteen thousand bucks. All right, it's it's a sick, serious hit uh, when you add it all up. All right, and, and frankly, nobody has that sort of cash just sitting around ready to cover things up, except for the banks. Uh, they have quite large budgets for it, okay? Um, <clears throat> now, most of you guys are already using cloud computing at some point or another. Uh, you already have employees using mobile devices at work. That's a trend which is not gonna slow down. Uh, however, most businesses that I see are doing this in a strategic, planned way. All right, there's no policies about it. Uh, and when something does happen, and it's more likely to happen because you don't have the policies and, and um, strategy in place, you're gonna get hit harder. So think about it. All right, now, if you hang on right till the end, I'm gonna um, make sure you get a, uh, it's, it's a template that has two security policies in it. One is for mobile device security, which covers off laptops, phones, mob, um, tablets, etc., and an acceptable internet usage policy. Well, acceptable usage policy, it's a bit more than just internet, right? Um, and, and there is tremendous value in just having those sorted and integrating it into your HR process, okay? And that's and that's free, and if you, um, uh, you, you at the very end if you get to the end and you um, click the link and go through into uh, requesting a, um, uh, a consultation you know that that's an extra boost of value right so um, <clears throat> a bit about me um, I could put on the video but uh, hey I don't want to scare anybody at this point of the day um, I'm the managing director of Vertec IT services uh, since 2010 I've been uh, running the ship uh, prior to that, I was a senior network engineer and, and systems engineer across a variety of organizations, including large corporates um, over in the UK. Um, also, I have a wife and two kids. My wife's a clinical psychologist. Um, I'm an army sergeant in the New Zealand reserves um, for the engineering corps. It's, we get to blow bridges up and build them, uh, sometimes in that order. Um, I'm a scout leader, love getting out for scouts, and um, I volunteer on the Spirit of Adventure as a watch assistant, which is tremendous good fun. All right, so and who Vertec IT Services is, is that, you know, we're the only company in Auckland who specifically specializes in logistics companies. Uh, we've been doing it for 10 plus years. We're Cargo's technical partners. And um, for all of our clients, you know, 
we offer a 100% hack-free money-back cybersecurity guarantee that's yet to be claimed, all right? So um, we're quite proud of that, um, and I'm very serious about making sure that our clients uh, sail their ship through the stormy seas of the internet uh, with nary a worry. Okay, so cybercrime. Uh, cybercrime is um, an awesome business model from the perspective of its um, low risk, high gain. Um, <laughs> your chance of getting caught is minimal. Um, it, you can automate it. Um, you don't actually require very many people in it. Um, uh, and um, better than that, you don't even need to be a, um, an expert because you can buy the tools that you need to execute um, successful scams are available off the shelf on the internet. Cool, eh? So um, just talking about the evolution of, um, of uh, crime. Um, in the old days, you know, you, you wanted to make a quick buck. You could pick up a club, hang out in the dark alley, and scod some, scon some rich toff over the back of the head and nick his pocket watch and, and pull for the coins out of his pocket. Um, then it went all high tech with uh, you know the, the the advent of steam, and you had these these trains that would uh, have you know three hundred people in them at a time, travelling through hours of um, of wilderness out in the. Uh, well, it didn't happen so much in New Zealand, but certainly out west, you know, it's a, the the train robberies are a well known storyline. And when you think about it, you got all this money just sitting isolated, all right? And you can scam a whole bunch of people in one hit. Fantastic, all right? What are they going to do? There's no cops out there. Easy, all right? And now moving forward into today, we're seeing an explosion of cybercrime, all right? You know, we, we heard about viruses and that kind of stuff going back. Uh, and, and in the early days of the internet, it was just spoiler type stuff, right? I mean, you know, just people seeing if they ca could destroy people if they could, just to see if they could. Um, and it, somewhere along the lines, it, it's become a business model. Right, because the organised crime syndicate syndicates that um, did prostitution and drugs and that kind of stuff, well, they've already got the capital. They can invest in something that's actually fairly lucrative, um, but carries almost no risk of um, capture. All right, easy. Why wouldn't you do that? Um, so, uh, and and these days, um, if you ever look at the, and you probably never will, but if you ever look at the the logs of a firewall. Uh, connected to the internet, um, the numbers of ta attacks that have been uh, rebuffed are in the, in the hundreds or thousands per hour. It's like sticking your head out the window of a snowstorm. It's just going to get buffeted. All right. So, and and one of the um, analogies that I use to describe um, the internet and the danger of it is that you know we all live in in a, a a nice benign society where there's actually reasonably low crime. You could probably leave your back door unlocked for days at a time and still have a reasonable expectation that most of your cat will still be inside your house if you came back on, on the Monday, right, after going away. Now, on the internet, it's, it's more like um, every bad guy on the planet lives zero distance from your house and they're constantly rattling your doors and checking your windows to see if they can get in. Let that sink in for a sec. Um, are people getting hit with it? Yep, they sure are. Um, over in the States, JP Morgan, 80 million households and 7 million SMBs hacked. All right. Um, it's not just one person selling a credit card at a time. These people are going for as much as they can get whenever they can. All right. And... and what I mentioned before about um, the digital underground black market of being able to um, purchase the tools that you need off the dark web, you know, you, you can, you can go out and like a US, US credit cards sell for the highest, right? And um, New Zealand and Australian credit cards don't sell for anything like that, but they might be 25, 30 NZ dollars to buy a credit card. Um, and, and that can, the price of that varies with how much details comes with the credit card. Does it include the, the CVV button um, number on the back of it? Does it include um, additional private information about name, address, that kind of stuff, all right? Uh, you can buy people's iTunes accounts, yeah, why not? 
You can be you buy the physical credit cards. You can get the cloners and set yourself in business. All right. You can even go buy fake ATM machines. All right. It, anyway, it's, it's a real business. These tools are out there, and you know the actual tools for setting up a, um, a ransomware scam. That's out there as well, uh, and that's uh, easy, relatively speaking, to implement. You know. Um, in, in fact, you can you can go share these with people. So you can um, have somebody else who does actually all the implementation for you, uh, and you get a cut. You just got to come up with the capital to, to implement and um, some other aspects of it. All right. Anybody want to have a, a guess in their own head as to what 141 means? 141. It's the average estimate, estimated cost associated with one stolen record, all right? Uh, now, that number doesn't encompass all the costs of a data breach to your organization. Now, you can imagine um, it's, it's not just the, the, the straight up stuff. It's, it's more like the uh, reputational damage and the loss of clients and the contracts. You gotta think about, well, these days, we don't have class action lawsuits in New Zealand, but we're about to move into um, a more regulated privacy regime, right? We, you're going to have to uh, mandatorily um, notify if you've suffered a privacy breach, right? And that's where it's going to get interesting because then you're going to need to think about PR marketing firm fees to, um, to restore the, the um, trust in your brand, which will be significant. This is going to be a really big thing in the near future, all right? Um, and then there's also things like non-compliance. Right? And then, of course, you know, imagine if you had to hire a, um, you've lost your database and you have to try and have that rebuilt by hand um, from other records, hopefully, that you have. Um, that is non-trivial, for sure, you, all right? And, of course, the obvious downtime, loss of productivity, et cetera, um, all right? Now, I mentioned JP Morgan and that kind of stuff, but realistically, nobody on this call is a JP Morgan, all right? Um, you know, with the tyranny of distance does not apply on the internet. You know, the, we, we're in a strategically benign environment, said Helen Clark. But like I said, zero distance to every bad guy on the planet. Really, I can reach out and touch every single one of us. Um, you, you know, one in five small businesses falls victim to cybercrime each year. Yep, and it's growing. Now it's, um, it, it's uh, unspeakable because. You know, like if you think that it's not going to happen to you and therefore you leave yourself open and exposed, you just, you are now becoming the low hanging fruit. All right. Because those, those large organizations, they're spending millions. They've got teams of people who do nothing but think up ways to try and get one step ahead of the bad guys. All right. And they have to be lucky all the time. All right. And then the, the, the lower end of um, the organization scale, um, you may be small and you may have lower value maybe as a mass attack type thing, but you can also automate all these attacks such that you can um, uh, scale up the attacks on SMBs. So it doesn't matter so much from, from the attacker's perspective because you know, it doesn't matter if you send 100,000 or 1 million emails. You know, it's... Uh, you, you, it's it's just too easy, right? So half of them were attacked at SMBs, right? They're easy. Okay. And you might be going, well, how come I don't hear more about it? Well, why would you? I mean, realistically, if, if you've been hacked and you've lost a whole stack of information, whether it's just like you've lost all of last year's orders and a client calls in and says, hey, can you just send me a repeat of last year's? You, you might just blag your way through it and rather than admit that you, you've, lo you've lost it. You know, you're not going to be calling up the police about that. Um, well, you might do, you might do, but truthfully, most people don't, all right? Um, you know, and, and there's a significant proportion of people who don't even know they've been hacked, all right? And I'll come across that when we, um, when we onboard our clients with our endpoint protection suite. Um, on a regular occurrence, we find that people have got infections and trojans on their machines that our systems uncover that their previous 
freeware or um, uh, El Cheapo antivirus suite haven't picked up. Okay, so it's uh, there's a lot of stuff which just kind of flies under the radar um, and could be lurking, waiting for an opportunity to um, attack you when you're most vulnerable. Anyway, horrible PR. Yeah, nobody wants to um, own up to that kind of stuff. All right, um, and um, you know, if if you had to um, announce it to everybody, it's going to cost you a lot more. So uh, just um, you know, people let it slide and, and and hope that it doesn't happen again. So um, just because you aren't worried about your information being stolen, you know, um, doesn't mean it's any less valuable to those people. All right. Now, uh, admittedly, not many of my clients are. Um, medical professionals, but, you know, we have accountants and um, uh, who, who, you know, may be holding client confidential, like commercially sensitive information on their laptops. Um, we've got uh, recruiters who will be having CVs galore, and you just know they're carrying them around on their laptops. Um, you know, like we make sure that we get them encrypted. Um, and, and, you know, that's one of the things you got to think about. All right. Um, so, you know, the, the, the problem is that uh, complacency is the thing that I see in New, in New Zealand. Uh, it's quite often it's a she'll be right attitude. Um, how likely is this to happen to me? One in five chances. Oh, some people take those odds, which I think is insane because nobody in small business has the time or the spare cash to deal with yet another crisis because business is difficult, right? If it was easy, everybody would be doing it, but it's not easy, all right? And the way I see it is I don't think that the people who are in, in business for themselves um, deserve the kind of uh, crap that gets thrown at them by um, these criminals, because they're really, they're, they're taking a the hard-earned money out of your pocket, the money that you might have been used to um, pay, up, pay down your debt uh, or provide bonuses to your staff, whatever, right? You know, they're taking away that opportunity, and I can't, I can't stomach it. So um, anyway, here are the seven biggest threats to your organization, right? And how to stop them. Okay. So here's the thing. Boom, boom, boom. Your, the, exp the number one threat is not external. It's your employees. Okay. Um, I have uh, a client in the past where they had they're a service provider of themselves of sorts. And they found that some of their clients' machines were running slowly and uh, they did a bit of investigation. They found that there was a crypto miner. A crypto miner, for those who don't know, is a, um, a software tool that's used to mine things like Bitcoin, these um, blockchain currencies that are out there highly speculative. Uh, what it does is it converts electrical energy into um, digital coinage. All right. Um, some people have made a fortune on this, but, um, and there you go. So if the, the main cost to it is uh, electricity to run the machines that do the, uh, the number crunching to produce these Bitcoins. So this guy had compromised using tools that he'd found on the dark web, hundreds of computers. All right, using this company's internal support tools from a home computer. All right, hundreds. Now, we found it, we dealt with it, we got it sorted. But that kind of thing could have destroyed their business in an afternoon, a uh, business that had been running for um, decades. Uh, you know, but beyond that, you've also got, you know, good people make mistakes. You know, just kind of accidentally doing this, that, the other, thinking they're doing the right thing, um, getting manipulated, what have you, um, or just using applications that open a hole that allows confidential data to flow out of the organization in, in an unsecured format, all right? Um, you get the actual actively disgruntled people, you know, who... Um, who actually destroy things intentionally. Now that's actually a lot rarer, but you know, there's an example from this, from just recently with this guy who had only been employed for a month, uh, 
utilized a admin password and when he got fired logged in afterwards and deleted removed 23 servers off the cloud all right and that cost that company half a million pounds Ooh, geez um so uh shadow it that's another big one all right like i mentioned with dropbox uh a lot of people use dropbox on just their personal dropbox account all right um and, and they're putting they're putting the company's files into it because maybe the um the, the company's vpn method is is painful or doesn't work or the, the it guys have never fixed it so they come up with a solution that's frankly insecure because once they put it out in the dropbox you don't know where that data's gone anybody could be um accessing it and and it's it's you've lost control of it and there's no tracking there's no auditing of it all right so now the employees are usually just trying to do um do their job efficiently because they haven't been given the tools to do it properly um and you got situations where um you know a good employee can do something um you know that they didn't think was wrong um and then uh you can get into a bun fight with the um uh the authorities and this is an example of a chap over in the states um he he got um all grumpy about it and decided to uh he felt like he was being held to ransom by a company that detected that um uh private medical information was found out on accessible from the internet um and uh regardless of whether he was being um held over a barrel by that company or not um the 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 federal authorities in the states decided to take him to task anyway um and you know that basically ruined him you know that's it's a bit of a um you know sometimes it's just not worth fighting the fighting the big guys on us you uh if you put the the protections in place you're less likely to get hit in the first place um malware <clears throat> uh significantly uh, i'm not kidding that i mean that number three hundred fifty thousand. you might look at that and just go ah oh, bollocks right no it the thing is the um the viruses it's not three hundred fifty thousand new virus being written, written every day what it is is that these tools that you can purchase which allow you to create a malware package which you can then send out to an email list in hope of getting somebody who clicks on it right or or, or re attacks a vulnerability in a in a browser or an application like adobe what have you they they're polymorphic right so they um you can get it and then the the application its signature is essentially randomized before it's released so and they can keep on changing right so every time that it spreads it can change its own signature and that way it just become when you're using antivirus tools that are uh, looking for particular um, traces of a uh, virus or malicious software um, each of these have to be picked up and detected and it, it, it's a case of somebody gets hit then um, then the signature gets added all right so it's it's a large scale thing and it's very, very difficult for security companies to keep on top of it. All right. So there's, there's never just one easy solution. All right. So, um, oh, a couple of stories for you guys. Eh? Um, director sextortion email. I had a, a client who freaked out because, um, called me on a, on a weekend, uh, from a boat um out in the Haraki gulf he was worried that he, he got one of these extortion emails where um they said hey we know what you're doing in front of your computer you've been a very naughty boy um i think your wife and all your colleagues would be um extremely um upset by the kind of sites you visit on the internet um you send us uh a thousand dollars in bitcoin to this bitcoin wallet um or we we'll release the pictures now the thing is i've sent out a blog about this to all my clients uh because this has been a uh it was a trending thing um but the thing that really got him was that it had included his email address uh, login and password in the email that he was sent which lent it a very great air of uh, plausibility now i looked at it and asked him a few questions and it was pretty quick to see that um he'd been using that same email password and login for 
better part of 10, 15 years, all right? And furthermore, he'd used it on lots of websites. So, and one of those websites, yes, had been hacked. And I'd done a live search on his email address and I found that, yeah, there was, there was more than one instance of his email address and password out there in the public domain, which, so then you get on the list and you get stamp, um, spammed with it. Um, I've seen a legal firm go down for two days with um, uh, malware because they're, um, you know, they, they weren't a client of ours, but I got called in to help them out. Um, their backup had been attacked as well as their server and, and it was quite a painful recovery process for them. Um, uh, I've, I've had personally, I've had a uh, in instance where somebody that I had fired had gone on to work for somebody else um, and they breached their bail conditions. I informed the police, they got arrested at their office, uh, their new, new office. And then later on, they went back and they, they vandalized the webs, the company website to, um, to trash talk them, to make it look like the company was trash talking them so that they could try and um, get evidence for their uh, personal grievance claim against the company. It was, it was mad. Like the police tracked their, the, the changes to their IP address to their home. So it was obvious that they had done it, but people are, and, you know, not all criminals are smart. Some of them, just this fact that it was malicious, it caused more worry and hassle and costs the company, you know, more to fix it up and that kind of stuff. It's just, it, you know, you just want to avoid it as much as you can. Now, um, and ransomware, we, we did pick up a client from a one-man band. They had, um, their server had crashed. It, it had kicked the bucket, right? It was an old box, hardware failure. Um, it was backed up by the one-man band IT guy. And he, was, he brought out a new, um, well, not a new, an old server, and he restored their server onto it, got them up and running. Um, and then they got ransomware on it, and he restored it again, and then it got ransomware again. Now, what he had done is he had left open a remote um, um, access port on their firewall. Well, they didn't have a firewall, they just a router. And so that um, their server was opened up to the internet and was um, directly ransomware through a brute forces attack, brute forces attack automated on the internet. Now, I mean, for me, that's just insane. And it was such an easy client to pick up because of that. But, um, oh, you know, they, they suffered a lot because of it and they just had enough. So, um, oh, right, number three, bank fraud. Um, uh, now, going back in time, that people might recall that there was the Crown Retail Deposit Guarantee Scheme. Um, that does actually doesn't exist anymore. That was pulled back, and that was a an artifact of the um, the GFC, um, uh, and it didn't really protect just general on, on everyday fraud. So, you know, what happens is if you do pay money to somebody accidentally, like they trick you into sending money somewhere else, you've probably got about twenty four hours to notify the bank get them to reverse it past that too late it's gone don't bother trying to sue the bank or kicking up a fuss um that, that you're not going to get them to pay pay it back all right that's just done all right and and there's that's where uh a lot of people are getting hung up because once you know once the money is out of your bank account time ticks past um there's nothing more to be done about it right you just simply as a business you do not have some of the protections that consumers do. Okay, bit of a busy page this one. Here's some tips for protecting yourself. And, and frankly, the information on this page is worth you attending this um, webinar. Okay, so um, if you're still using debit cards for anything in business, uh, you wanna kick that to the curb, all right? Use credit cards if you can. Um, uh, there's a lot more protection on credit cards and you really want to take that advice. Um, going an extra step, if you're a bit larger, larger business and you um, are doing, have somebody who's kind of dedicated to the accounts payable role, um, not a bad idea to have a separate um, device dedicated to just doing the online banking, right? And that's all it does, right? Because if you kind of, uh, not, if you just separate the normal day-to-day -day activity especially checking emails, browsing the internet from doing what is quite a sensitive activity, 
paying money, then you're going a long way to making sure that you don't have your bank accounts emptied out. Okay. Um, on ASB, I know you can do this. You can set up an alert on the bank to say, hey, any withdrawal over X number of dollars, flick me an email, all right? Uh, and that way, you know, if, if, if you've got somebody who else is involved in making payments in your organization, it just gives you another little twitchy thing that you can look out for. Um, okay, uh, definitely require your authorization before any, um, you know, direct payments are made. And if you don't have two-factor authentication to log into a bank account, um, I'm not sure which uh, bank you belong to, but that should have happened a long time ago. Um, you can also segregate your money, um, so you, you spread out bank accounts, um, so it's less likely that one account is going to get drained um, and take everything with it. Um, and um, if you don't already have it, get some cybercrime insurance, right? Because um, oh, and also make sure that if, if CEO impersonation fraud is covered. Right, because it's possible that they could exclude that, which is frankly one of the more likely things that's going to happen. All right, and that's where somebody gets access to the boss's um, email account and then they uh, bypass all the spam filtering and that kind of stuff and send email directions to the accounts payable team to make payments to or change supplier bank accounts um, in, in your accounting system. Uh, and that way, you know, the money can go get squirted out quite quickly and um, you, you're, you're stuffed, all right? Okay. Whew. Okay. Uh, there we go. Number four, social media. Okay. Um, so just recently there was a bit in the news about um, Facebook apps. Um, now oh, these are third-party apps using Facebook passwords um, that stored user credentials in, in plain text. What I mean by plain text is that you, you just don't know, I'm um, sorry, the, 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 if somebody gets access to those passwords, they can read them. You know, normally passwords are stored encrypted, so they're not human readable. They can be decrypted by the system, but not by the, um, the users. And in Facebook's instance, they're, uh, I think there was 2,000 employees had access to those passwords, and they and and they were they were accessed tens of thousands of times. Like, what were they doing, right? And that was only picked up relatively recently. And and then Facebook accounts get hacked every day, just immense numbers. Uh, threat number two: social media. Is that it's a significant loss of productivity. Um, now, the, the why I see social social media as a threat to you is primarily in the amount of money that gets wasted on people's salaries because they're spending your money on keeping themselves amused whilst at work. All right, um, it's it's you know in, in Aussie um, there was in two thousand and seventeen a survey that admitted that well, the one in 10 workers, sorry, one in 10 workers admit more half of the working week is spent wasting time. Um, and social media, spending time on that, accounted for probably 39% 39, 39 of those people. Uh, like, which is enormous, right? Just, I mean, look at that, more than one hour wasted, 39%. That's just, it's crazy, right? That's one hour per week. Uh, you know, that adds up. If it's one, but I've, I've heard stats of um, half an hour per day, 20 minutes to half an hour per day. That adds up over, like if you pay somebody 50,000 bucks, you know, that's getting towards $5,000 per annum. You know, you times that by, you know, five, 10, 15 staff, and you're looking at some serious coin that you could be, it was basically, it's, it's money lost out of your bottom line, but it's certainly not adding anything to the top line. Then there's the risk of bad PR, right? Like this dude over in, in the States, you know, taking, posting photos online of him stepping in bins of lettuce, right? At a burger. Yep. Um, people do it. And that's damage. All right. So uh, again, you've got to have, you've got to have some um, consideration for 
not just the hours that they're spending in there, but they could also be making disparaging comments about your, you as an employer. They could be disclosing confidential information. Um, and as we've seen with, um, on Facebook with the, um, the tragedy down in Christchurch, uh, you know, people are being fired for contravening social media policies within organizations because the worry is, is if they're sharing that streaming video um, and, and with other employees, they could be traumatizing those employees for which as an employer, you become liable for because of the environment that you've allowed to occur. Um, it's a bit nuts, but yeah, you know, this is the kind of stuff that you can be on the hook for. Ransomware is still huge. Um, what do we get from like Taranaki, uh, Taranaki school back in August last year, um, they had all of their files locked up, encrypted, and um, nothing they could do about it. Yeah, what's that, the joke there? Writer once asked a literary agent what kind of writing pays the most. The answer was simple, ransom notes. Okay, and that's, that's still a biggie, that's quite scary. Um, a lot of our uh, disaster recovery plans are, have been jacked up simply in response to um, ransomware. Um, it's not just, can you recover a file or folder? It's, can you recover all the files and folders in a rapid period of time? Um, <laughs> because, you know, it's, you know, if you have to do it one by one, it would be painful, right? Um, and nobody wants to pay a ransom. You know, that's, that's just reinforcing the wrong kind of behavior. Um, ransomware is proliferating. There's a, different, a couple of different angles here. Um, you can, um, there, there is, uh, this, this is okay, this is a bit, a bit dodgy, right? Hentai porn is a, it's an anime type of porn featuring very young women in sexually explicit scenarios. It's very popular in Japan and there is a bit of a, um, Ooh, what's it say subculture on the internet now I don't know who does what these days it's um, frankly I don't want to but um, so you can imagine that somebody might find this as a really cool thing that they want to check out right um, it's exciting so they go looking for free hentai right because that's what people do they don't want to pay for it they'll see if they can get it free and that's a really easy way to hook somebody in to downloading an application which allows them to view it now, could you imagine if you're done that and then um, you, <laughs> you get a pop-up on your computer that says, uh, huh, you know, your device has been locked for safety reasons. Um, if you don't pay, you know, a thousand dollars in Bitcoin through to this wallet thing, then we will report you to the department, um, the, the FBI. People will pay that money, um, you know, and, and it's, and it's hideous, all right? So um, also those downloads for applications, they can come with Trojans that uh, will uh, take control of your computer. It can be used to take photos of people or record video of them. And that um, sextortion scam that I talked about before, it can, it's not just a fake scam. They can for real scam you by getting those photos. So I mean, that's, that's less common, but it does happen. All right, um, and regardless, if you've been ransom weird, even if you're innocent, you know, you, you still get your files to recover, right? <clears throat> Number six, uh, unsecured, unmonitored mobile devices in your network. Um, just think about um, how much data some people might have on their computer. Now imagine they leave that laptop in the back of their car while they go into a Burger King on the way down to on, on a business trip and they, their car windows get smashed, um, the laptop is gone, all right? If that laptop is not encrypted, you can simply take out the hard drive and put it into another computer and you can read what's on it. It's that simple. Uh, doesn't matter if you've got a password on your front screen, that's just only protecting it whilst the computer's all together, right? Whilst it's sitting on your desk, so somebody else can't come along and log into it. All right, and, and there's an example there from uh, a legal aid lawyer that compromised 80 cases last year. You know, um, now could you could you imagine how much pain and anguish that's going to cause for that lawyer? <laughs> you know, uh, or that law firm, um, which is insane. So, um, like uh, another example is where people are um, fiddling around on their phones out in public. 
uh, and I'm, I, I see it's a regular thing. People complain that, like, why do you put a password on my phone? It's like, well, because we need to. What if somebody just snatched the phone out of your hand and ran off with it? It's really easy to do. And then they've got one, they've got a really cool iPhone. They will just change the password on it straight away. Purge out, they might, if you're lucky, they might purge out your data. Um, if you're unlucky, they might decide that, that now that they've got access to your email account, they might do some uh, uh, scamming themselves. Um, and why not, you know? Some people might not even report that to the business because they'd be too afraid that um, they've, they've, they did something silly, all right? Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and, and finally, spam, all right? This is, a, this is just the biggest one out there, right? Because probably about 75% of all threats, or that's right, all incidents, security incidents, are rooted in a email coming into the organization. And um, I, I see examples of these get it coming through. I mean, like we've got a pretty good system, but there are still instances where somebody else has been compromised and their email address is on a whitelist for one of our clients. So it comes through. Now, we try and keep our guys pretty switched on so that they can spot these things when they happen, but it's still a really big thing that you need to make sure is covered off. And um, uh, well, it's, uh, let's talk about how do you protect yourself, right? Because I know I'm getting into a bit of a downer with 45 minutes in. Um, okay, so here's, I'm just gonna zoom through some of the things. And these these are like probably the, the big seven that you should have in place. And there's, this, there's another eight or so um, aspects that I get into when um, when I'm when I'm doing consulting with clients. Uh, the, the first one is um, email filtering. Uh, Office 365 Gmail are perfect. They both have some aspects of spam protection built in, but it really isn't the shit. It isn't everything. Um, it, and if you're still on a, like a pop three old kind of extra dot code then you're then you're even worse off because it's just some of these um, uh, private. Uh, uh, email hosting, there's, there's, there's no protection whatsoever. Um, and there's lots more layers of protection that are built into modern uh, spam filtering. All right, so you, you need to consider that. Um, web filtering, one for productivity, and two for um, trying to filter out those dodgy URLs that might come in an email, all right? Um, so it's a, it's a double plus good by putting in web filtering into an organization. Advanced endpoint protection. There's quite a bit here, right? Um, now I'm going past here. If you see the blue, the green square there, anti rootkit and ransomware protection. So this is all in a, a beyond just antivirus, all right? So, you know, anti rootkit because there are some malware that will hide from your endpoint protection, your, your antivirus, and just sit below it. Um, you can get anti ransomware protection that it detects the activities, the behaviors that uh, ransomware encryption programs do and then stop it from continuing and roll it back. Um, having password management utilities and policies in your organization, setting local administration uh, rights and restricting it uh, correctly within your environment so people can't install applications willy-nilly, um, doing application whitelisting and device control, blocking USB ports, all that kind of good stuff, all right? Those are kind of the, the enhancements that you can get in place to make it pretty much hard in your shell, as it were. <sighs> Ransomware proof disaster recovery. I talk a lot about the 321 backup rule um, and retention. Uh, a lot of organizations have, I've seen recently, I've gone, they got like an external disk drive and they have maybe three or five of them that they swap around day to day um, and they're doing daily full backups of their server. It's like, you've got five days of retention. Well, what if you need to recover something from three months ago? You know, like, well, you're stuffed. You know, um, what, if, what if the ransomware, and, and this does happen, is designed to wait for 30 days to encrypt your system. And it's got a logic rule that says um, execute on a Friday, every Friday, right? So you might restore it from one week back and you're thinking you're good, but then just reinstalls again because you haven't actually removed it. Okay, so um, besides that, Office 365 and G Suite, you've got like um, OneDrive and, and Google Drive. Uh, you're still responsible, there's a shared security model for these cloud organizations. So you have to 
like in the old days with you had like a small business server sitting in your organization you could you'd have your backup on it and you'd be good all your files are backed up your emails all backed up and you can restore from that when you go to office 365 or g suite once you've deleted it and it's gone out of the deleted items folder there's only a certain period of time that can pass before you've lost it forever all right um and a surprising amount of people don't test restore their backups i've come across a client that had their backups, they were swapping out the external drive, taking them home religiously every day without fail. They'd been doing it for a year, except the device that they were swapping it in and out of had been switched off for a year. Like it was simply powered off. They were just going through the motions. And they were lucky that in a year, and that during that year, they had actually no cause to do a recovery of any kind. But if they had gone to, they would have been deeply disappointed. And two of the things that you guys have got to think about from, a, from an organizational perspective is how long can you afford to be down for? Uh, how much does it cost you when you're down? And if you do have to restore from a backup, how far back in time can you afford to lose? Those are quite key concepts. Uh, all right. Moving on. UTM firewalls or unified threat management firewalls, all right? Like just have, if you've got a router that you got given by your internet service provider it's got no smarts in it whatsoever it really is dumb as a brick it connects you to the internet uh, and doesn't do anything more than that all right that's another layer of protection that you can put in place that can sniff actively sniff the traffic that's flowing through your network and look for signs of infection now in the past like in the in the early thousands the uh, early 2000s this kind of stuff was obscenely expensive and available only to enterprises. But these days, you can any business can afford this, and it scales down really well. All right, um, you know we put in place proactive alerting as well, so we can find out if, if something pops up in a client's network, we can jump on it and actually try and get ahead of it. All right, because the speed is of the essence with these things. Dark web monitoring. Sad fact is, people reuse their work logins out on external sites. Those sites get hacked those passwords are then used against them in combination attacks against the organization. All right. So getting dark web monitoring is a, is a good idea and it's not expensive either. This is really probably one of my biggest ones these days is um, investing and in putting some cybersecurity awareness training in for your, your staff and your organization. It's not a one and done thing. You know, you can't just get me in, uh, stand in front of a room of your staff and me, do an in-depth presentation like this or go and, 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 and expect it to last. People data dump, you know, you, we've all done exams at school and then like three days later, you'd be like, tell me about trigonometry again. <laughs> Good luck. Summer holidays, man. All right. So, you know, you, you need ongoing testing and training for these things um, so that the, it's, it's continually reinforced repetition, repetition. And so that there is a fallback position, but when the technology fails, that the humans sitting in the seat who are the main assets and also the main threats to your organization can um, do what they need to be able to do when the threat arises. So the bottom line is you guys need to get serious about protecting your, your business and your company organization from cybercrime. All right. Um, you know, but what does that look like? One, get yourself a threat assessment. All right. If you're lacking in security now, do you know what that is? You know, do you know where all the risks are that you're currently faced with? Uh, are you properly backed up? Whose job is it to actually look at the stuff? And how do you know if it's working or not? All right. Two, develop an action plan. Get the big items ticked off first. Do the rocks, then the pebbles, then the sand, right? Uh, three, ongoing maintenance, right? Because you don't want to take a shield be right approach to it. If you're not putting some money into this on a regular basis, then you're just hoping that you'll be okay um, and hope is not a plan right first steps free though you give us a call well actually go through and do our threat assessment um uh threat assessment and you know we'll come out i'll interview you or your key people understand what your current policy uh, setup is understand what your business environment is where your growth patterns where your needs are what your current concerns are um and i'll, I'll tease out a few more i'm sure all right um We'll conduct a hands-off examination, if you like, with your systems and hardware, just visual. Or if you'll let us, um, you're okay with us doing this. Um, we'll install software agents that can sniff out, and that, that gives us a whole lot more information. All right? 
will cover off um, 15 key uh, items in there and um, and we've got a 42 point checklist that you usually go through and our deliverable for you guys there is a simple traffic light report you know is it red orange or green all right whereas what's critical is going to be red that you need to take action on right away orange some issues there you need to uh, address at some point green you're you're okay for the meantime all right um, some people have really good results out of that and um, others uh, are left quivering messes but it's our job to make sure that at least you know about it so you've got the opportunity to change things all right so free everybody who signs up will get a uh, mobile device security and it's a password uh, security template in there as well um, it's the kind of thing that you can just do control H find and replace with your company name um, and you can put that into your uh, your HR policy into your induction template um, and so it's there to start using you can deliver that out to all of your existing staff get them to agree to it and boom you've at least get set in place some expectations that you have for your the organization all right um, and uh, I have already done a data search a live data search on dark web for everybody who registered right for this um, webinar so everybody's going to get the results of that uh, quite a few were, you, you, especially the newer organizations there was um, no threats whatsoever some of the older ones yet there is some stuff out there and um, uh, I encourage those who have um, results in there that they contact the people on that list they uh, make sure that they have Mm, they've changed that password since that that exposure and that they have also changed it to everywhere where they're um, exposed uh, they've used that same password and please just don't add password one two three or whatever it is to the end of it because that makes it's trivial the the, the scammers know about that little trick it's not very clever um, and it does not protect you all right so <clears throat> so there's three things you need to know okay I I'm obscenely busy right now, um, but because of my um, dedication to looking after SMBs, um, I'm, uh, I'm putting this out there to uh, uh, help um, two people per month, right, through this by doing a free um, assessment. It does take a chunk of my time, um, but I believe it's worth it. So, you know, there's no, ob no obligation whatsoever for you to buy anything from me or do anything. Um, I'm giving you the information and it's your choice. Now, obviously, I'd be really happy if everyone today here became a client of mine, but, you know, it's, it's, it's just uh, as a service to you, all right? Um, if, you're not, if you're not serious about um, uh, setting up your organization for long-term security, don't, don't sign up. Um, it, you know, you'd just be wasting my time. I, I need people who are committed to having their business grow safely and securely, all right? Um, if, you're busy, if you're already a client of mine, um, don't worry, um, I've already got you covered. We'll, we'll have a chat at some point and we can um, go through and see what else that we need to do. Um, uh, and, and I'm not gonna be putting any kind of sales pressure on you guys. It's just, um, I lay it out, this is what, what it is. Uh, and there are some things which make sense and some organizations uh, and some which are smaller may need a, a lower level of uh, protection or doesn't make sense to throw everything at it right away and, but you can develop it over time but there, there's always a few really uh, simple things that most people can do to vastly lift them up the tree of the low-hanging fruit right uh, there is an application process for this consultation. Um, one, I want to make sure that I can help you. Uh, and two, there's going to be some information I need to get about uh, you and your organization if you're not already a, uh, an existing customer. Um, and then we, so we can schedule in the, um, so before we can schedule in the, the first meeting to help uh, prepare us uh, to make the meeting as productive as possible. All right? So, uh, uh, da -da, da -da, da -da. and so what to do now? What you need to do if you want us to engage with you for this free audit is go visit www.vertech with an h on the end.co.nz forward slash audit all right and we'll take 
uh, those people on a first come first serve basis to a month so six in total for the quarter um, and and there's there's no exceptions to this we're not I'm, I'm not gonna um, try and see everybody in the first month um, it's only the first six um, if there's more than six who want to um, want the free consultation I'll do that um, starting in the next corner uh, quarter uh, in, in July and um, we'll approach you then to, to crank into that um, so there it is uh, I've uh, I'll at the end of this I'll send out the uh, the live data um, reports and uh, for those people who hit the application form online on the website that's uh, vertec.co.nz forward slash audit go there now I will um, uh, send through those uh, policies for you and uh, we can begin the conversation so hey thank you very much for coming along this afternoon it's now coming up to four o'clock and um, we've uh, got the, the a long weekend um, if there is any questions uh, that people would like to ask we've got a few more minutes and what I'll do is I will if you've got if anybody's got a microphone uh, now's the time to do it oh I think Chris uh, Lindy has a question so I'll just unmute you Chris um, yeah hi can you hear me I can yes go ahead yeah hi Daniel thanks for your um, your webinar it's really, really useful um can you give indications of you know what kind of costs would be involved say there's a business say 10 full-time employees and they want to engage you on a regular basis, like you were suggesting, you know, not just a one-off assessment, but you know, the, the upfront assessment and then you know, regular checks. And, and how often should those checks be? Quarterly, halfly, whatever. Hmm. Okay. Can you give indication of costs? Sure, so um, for us, when we're offering out our, um, our flat rate plan, right? We, we throw everything in there. Um, a lot of the things that I've talked about today are included in that and uh, along with all remote support and we set up a regular ticketing uh, so we're prompted to go out and uh, check the, the, the stats um, besides the ones that are set to alert us and get into our ticketing system automatically um, now for a lot of that that'll be around $100 per month uh, per staff member um if you're an organization with 10 staff members there then you, then you're looking it's like a total it engagement really you're, you're covered for everything low to go uh there um if you're if you're a larger organization and you've got like an it manager or, or a coordinator in-house who does a lot of the grunt work then we tailor it for that organization so um there, there's a, a split of responsibilities um but you know at that includes our cybersecurity guarantee to the to the client as well. Um, if it's a smaller organisation who don't, um, perhaps they uh, don't have the 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 activity that re, you know requires a um, a flat rate plan of that, then we have uh, lower options as well. But um, that the hundred dollars per per month per person um, is the uh, the kind of standard there. Does that answer you, Chris? Hello, Chris, did that come through okay? Oh, you're on. Uh, Sorry, you, me? You, you went back on mute, so I didn't hear anything you said after I <laughs> said. Go ahead. Okay, can you hear me okay? I can, yes. Okay. Um, you know, sometimes, uh, sometimes your customers want evidence that you... Uh, have like a third party security company engaged with you you know they want so they want you to do a security assessment they'll but then also they want to see that you've got your not just your software but your offices and your employees all this kind of stuff you've just been talking about mm -hmm. so do you do you provide that kind of evidence that we can then give to our clients uh Sorry, so what perspective are you calling from there, Clint, uh, Lynn, uh, Chris? So, is you, so as a on selling our services, or are you? No, no. Um, if we have a, if we have a client who wants evidence of the security in place for our software and the security in place for our 
our physical security. Mm. Um, you know, we can do questionnaires, etc. Sometimes they want evidence, um, so of uh, IT security. Oh, um, right. We, we've been asked, uh, so like a PCI compliance uh, questionnaire that you get sent by your your customer to prove that yeah you are complying with their corporate security. Is, is that the kind of thing? Yeah, kind of like that. Yeah, and mm. but also that you know they want to see like um, evidence uh, security assessments and, being yeah. done and remediation plans and things like that. Yeah, that, that can that can be built into the the plan. Um, generally, it's uh, like a, we, we deal with that on a, on an ad hoc basis. To, to be honest, most SMBs aren't in, encountering that, but like I've got a couple of clients who have to do this on an annual basis um, or when they're engaging with a larger corporate, um, and we just work with them to to uh, produce those. Uh, often, that's actually a point where we um, they realise that they perhaps need to step up what they're doing um, and do a bit more investment. And uh, like for penetration testing, that kind of stuff, uh, we engage with a, a specialist provider on that because that is a whole kettle of fish. Like in IT, you know, there's a lot of specializations out there. Um, our bag is to, is to provide all the main infrastructure in a secure manner and then beyond that you've got the people who, who are responsible for websites and um, or databases and uh, they require a bit more uh, analysis with respect to are they providing applications that are secure and there's examples out there of like um, uh, web applications based on MongoDB, right? And older versions of MongoDB had a port that was open to the internet by default for remote control with default admin credentials. And there's a lot of people who are who produce applications who um, just do so on the main the main target is just get stuff working, just get it working. All right. And that's get the minimum viable product out the door and go for gold, right? And then they sell it. And there's a lot of, that's, that's where a lot of these hacks come from is because then those organizations may not be producing those apps on a, um, in a, in a, with, a with a robust security framework in place. Now, I'm not a coder, so I, I'm not the best person to, to talk about that kind of stuff. And that's why we will, um, uh, on those specific things, we will, you know, we can do the good, the, the, the foundation and then we pass it off to specialist providers and, and get them to quote on that kind of stuff, Chris. Okay. Mm. All right. Thanks for that. Cheers. No worries. Uh, does anybody else have a question? Oh, um, if you, there is a uh, chat function in the Zoom uh, that you can hit. Um, I will unmute everybody now and just see if there's anybody who wants to talk, if they haven't figured out how to raise their hand or, uh, there we go. Everybody's unmuted. Has anybody else got a question before we sign off for the day and get onto our Easter weekend? No? All right. Very good. Okay. Thank you all very much for coming. Um, I appreciate the time that you've taken to spend this with me and listen to me blab on for a good hour. Um, I hope that you have a safe Easter weekend, drive safely, um, be nice to the kids, don't overdose on chocolate. All right, <laughs> cheerio. <laughs> good one. Oh, here, no, there's a check, there's a check question. Oh, no, thanks. No worries, Amber, you have a good one. All right, all right. Thank you. Bye-bye.